Well, good morning. Let's take our Bibles and let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, while you're flipping there, I'll tell you a few things. Justin is uh, some family time this morning, and uh, he and Ashley usually do that um, as far as going to see. And he was happy. They get to, uh, they're actually worshiping with uh, Ashley's grandmother this morning. So she was real happy um, to, to have that. So. <clears throat> Um, Matthew chapter 20. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Um, so out in the lobby, we have some physical copies of a uh, Christmas devotional. Um, Crossway uh, publisher hit, hit me up in, uh, I guess, July, and they were offering 50 free copies to churches. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take y'all up on that. And they paid for the shipping and all that. Anyway, two options with that. There's, there's a limited physical copy. I think if every family gets one, we should be okay. But there's QR codes because we're QR community church. So um, right in front of these, there's a QR code and that's the, the full PDF of this. So if you want a physical book, grab one. But if you're lean more digital, grab that. And, you know, we probably won't run out of physical copies that way. So however you want to do it out there. Um, if, if you don't know how QR code works, ask a friend. They will thoroughly teach you. Anyway, this, uh, this starts on uh, December the 1st and runs through Christmas Day. So that's why we're getting them to you today. Next Sunday will be December 1st. So um, there you go. So take advantage of that and uh, thankful for, uh, for good publishers and, and people like that. Um, this past week, the, the missions team met and uh, they uh, will have voted on um, a, some proposed mission partners for the next year. We'll be letting you know who those are. Some stuff changed a little bit, but I'm thankful that we as a church are going to help people in this county, people in this country, and people across the world preach the gospel to every tongue, tribe, and nation. Amen? Um, I, I am dressed a little more spiff this morning. This is my official protest to you people who don't celebrate Thanksgiving, who set up Christmas trees July the 5th, okay? So I decided that I was going to dress up and that I was going to celebrate Thanksgiving, okay? Um, yeah, so I will probably dress up for Christmas, but this is my Thanksgiving giddy-up. All right, um, Paul, put this up because this is, this is my second protest this morning. Put that picture up if you don't mind. So this is the way that I feel about Thanksgiving and Christmas, the relationship, okay? So that's how I feel right now. So I'm going to make sure that we celebrate, that at least me and my house will celebrate Thanksgiving. And, and Lauren's like one of those real tree people, um, not camo, but like she wants a real tree in the house. Her mom bought a tree last year and it went up in like five minutes apparently and you can hit different buttons. And I said, why don't we have one of those? And she said, well, they're expensive. And, and then secondly, she's like, I want a real tree. And I'm thankful that I'm married to a real tree person. If you're not a real tree person, no problem. But Thanksgiving is this week. Public service announcement. Okay? It's this week. So December's next um, Sunday. So what that means is today, I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 20, and I want to, in some ways, set our hearts towards Thanksgiving. Um, and in a few minutes, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And what an opportunity for us as we think about physical blessings and material blessings and relational blessings this week for us to understand that all that comes through the blessing of Jesus Christ in our place for our sin. Amen? So I want us along those lines too, though, to go to Matthew chapter 20, and the title of the message this morning is Grateful for His Grace. And this passage, 1 through 16, and, and I want to go back to Matthew, that's where Justin took us several months or several weeks ago. We've been hanging out kind of in between Matthew 14 and Matthew 20, and so I thought it was good for us to, to go back to this again, and I think it illustrates exactly um, the sentiment that, that's on my heart or been in my mind this week. This is a parable. Some of your subtitles may have laborers in the vineyard or the parable of the laborers. It's actually a continuation of a narrative that starts back in 1916. So I'm just gonna mention this and we'll unpack it a little later. This parable takes place immediately following the story the encounter of the rich young man with Jesus. If you remember that story, you may not. There was a young, rich, religious man. He comes before Jesus and he says, how do I get eternal life? 
And Jesus throws the law on him, and he says, hey, I've done all that, you know, which is, you know, and he's telling a lie about, you know, saying that he's kept the commandments. But anyway, and so Jesus takes his thumb and, and figuratively puts it on the dude's idol, and he says, hey, go sell all you have, and then come follow me. And the Bible says that this guy chose his riches over Christ. He turned around and went back. He was unwilling to let go of the idol of mammon or money. And so Peter asked a question in verse 27, and he goes, hey, what about us? We left everything to follow you, which is like, time out, Peter. You were neither rich or religious when Jesus found you, right? You were a fisherman who couldn't catch fish. See, last week, right? So I, I love the fact that it just seems as if the last six weeks, we've got a, a lot of episodes involving Peter. So today, this story again is teaching off something that Peter said in response to what Jesus did. Uh, I didn't mention it last week, and, and Jeremy Stevens uh, said something to me this morning and that I think is really important. Um, every time Peter messed up, though, we see Jesus pursuing him or teaching him. The, the greatest example being when Jesus comes and restores him in John 21 on the beach. So Simon Son of John, do you love me? And when Jesus restored Peter, Peter denied Jesus how many times? He asked him three times, do you love me? The grace of Jesus to restore us. And so this right here is really good because this story in Matthew 20 comes out of a question that Peter asked. Let's get to the text. Matthew 20, it'll be on the screen for you as well. One through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too. <clears throat> and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages. Beginning, notice, with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those first hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled. It's imperfect tense, so they were grumbling. They were grumbling at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour. You've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Or is your eye bad because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. Lord, help us to understand this. Help us to come away, Lord, not with spiritual entitlement, but with humble gratitude and thankfulness for what you've done for us in Christ. And we ask it in your name. Amen. This is really part two of an answer, or really a, a, a teaching. Jesus, back in 1923, talks about how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And he ends chapter 19 by looking at Peter and saying, hey, Peter, this rich guy left and, and he will be last. But the last, the people who aren't rich and who don't have understanding of me, but when they come to believe in me, guess what? They will be first. And it seems as if, oftentimes, those of us who in some sense are first now in the fact that we know the Lord and we're growing in, in a spiritual walk and we're, we're trying to learn and trying to follow and obey Jesus, oftentimes we can forget that we were last. Those of us Gentiles, those of us who have a track record of sin, whether gross outward sin or vile self-righteousness and evil on the inside, we can often forget that, guess what? 
we were last. And so to do that, just to, to kind of check the disciples here, because the context from 1 to 16 isn't a rich young man that's debating salvation and following Jesus. This is a group of disciples, minus Judas, he's here, but the majority, 11 of the 12, are following Jesus, they know Jesus, they have a relationship with Jesus, they're eternally secure, but Christ, just to check their hearts and to promote gratitude and thankfulness, shares this story. I want you to see first the master's heart. And the master's heart is that he seeks out the idle and the hopeless. So, I want you to understand this is a parable. And so Jesus is not like giving strategic business plans on how to hire people, okay? Or, or a pay scale here, okay? So it's a parable, okay? There, there's a central point, And the central point is in verse 16, the last will be first and the first last. The central point, as we'll see, is that God treats all of his children equally. That's the central point. So don't get lost in the, in the trees and miss the forest, okay? But what I want you to see is he is showing us the master's heart. And we know that in verse one, the kingdom of heaven is like. So anytime in the gospels or when Jesus is talking and you see for the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus is basically saying, here's a visible, physical example of an invisible spiritual reality. You can't see the kingdom of heaven. It, it doesn't like come in, in, in appearance, Jesus talked about the workings of the Holy Spirit, and what did he say? The Spirit works like the wind. You, you can't see the wind, you can see the change the wind makes. And so, in a, and so Jesus is saying, when the kingdom of heaven comes, or there's dynamics in the kingdom of heaven, and this is what it's like. And he describes it as a master. So let's just add a few comments here about this master. Notice in verse one, he's master, and he is master of a house, so he owns a house. And then it says at the end of verse one that it is his vineyard. So he not only has a house, he has a vineyard. And in verse two, apparently there were people needing work, and so he agreed with them. He was the one that set the terms, they agreed to the terms. Now, here it's a denarius. Maybe some of your translations have a penny. It's, it's not like a one cent that we would have, a denarius was the Roman equivalent of a day's wage. So what is happening here, this is like he offered it and they agreed to it, and this is not, he's not shortchanging them. This is what people would, would get paid for to do that work. It's equitable, it's fair. And it's important to see that out the gate, that there's nothing shady going on at the end, okay? So in their time, they would understand that they agreed to what somebody should, so, so, so understand, the master owns a house, he owns a vineyard, he sets the terms, they agree. Then it says in verse three that he went out about the third hour. Now, important for this story is to understand the way time went down in the Jewish mindset. The day would roll from 6 p.m. in the 24-hour period would run from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. But the working day would run from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So the first hour of the day would be six. What would the third hour of the day be? Nine. My mind's getting confused now. The sixth hour of the day would be noon. The ninth hour of the day would be three, and the 11th hour then would be 5 p.m. It's important to note what's going on here. So it says that he goes out about the third hour in verse three, which is 9 a.m., and he saw people standing idle in the marketplace, literally workless, with no work. Now, we've seen that in, in our culture sometimes in public places. People will just go and stand hoping that somebody comes by in order to what? in order to say, hey, do you, you, you need a job today? Now, I will confess, um, one time I took, I took this cultural picture to the extreme. Um, there was one time that I was actually doing a, a game on the radio, and the officiating was atrocious. Now, some of y'all are, are just mad about yesterday, and this is my one college football comment. Check in on your old Miss friends. Check in on your Alabama friends today, okay? So, yeah, see, nobody left. Some of y'all still heard about it. Anyway, the... Usually, obviously, 99% of the time, you just, if there's a bad call on the field, you just say, hmm, well, I saw that differently, and then you move on to the next play. Uh, this is a Northeast Jones Quitman game, and Northeast Jones got hosed about four or five times. So I made the comment on the air, and it was taken with, from, from people of all schools, because people were texting me and, and thanking me for the comment. I just literally said on the air, I said, I think 
Somebody rolled into town and saw these dudes standing out in front of Dollar General and said, hey, you want a job? Come officiate. I made that comment. Um, I don't think I ever made that comment again. Nobody scolded me for it. But that was the idea, is that people are standing in the open saying, we don't have work. Now, in this context... It would be the reason they would go to the central part of the town, to, to, to the main part of the town, is because if they don't work that day, guess what? Their family doesn't eat. It, it's hard for us in our American entitlement to picture that. It still happens. And we see it, as I just got back from India, it's common and very common in many places. People will just go out and try to get work because they can't eat otherwise. And so he does this, notice, at the third hour in verse three. And then in verse five, he goes out at the sixth hour and he goes at the ninth hour. And so he has this, about every three hours he's going out and he's finding idle people. And we're told at the the group that was at 9 a.m. in verse four, He says, hey, go into my vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. Now, he doesn't tell them what they're going to get paid, but it's a promise that they will be treated fair and equitable. And so they say, okay. So the point here is that Jesus is saying the same thing happened at nine, it happened at noon, it happened at three. But in verse six, it says, now the 11th hour, so the day is gone. 11 of the hours of the working day are gone. And the master, guess what he's still doing? He's still going out and he's still hiring people. Again, this is not like business strategy, okay? That's not the point. The point here is to show you the heart of the master. And so he goes out and he again asks, why are you standing here idle all day? Nobody's hired us. Well, then you come into the vineyard too. And so the master is going out at all parts of the day, early in the morning, mid-morning, high noon, early afternoon, and at the end of the day, and he's bringing people in. It's very interesting, the word idle here is is to be without work, but in in the context here, it's these people don't have any, like, like purpose or aim or or they're just kind of wandering. And and if nothing changes in their... (laughs) Life, there's going to be want and need, and there's eventually going to be lack, sickness, even death. And so I think it's really interesting that the master is all day long going out, finding people without hope, finding people without purpose, and he is bringing them, check this, into his vineyard. I think all of us this morning who are in Christ, I don't want to assume that everyone in this room is born again. I would never make that assumption. But those of you who are in Christ, you would admit that even though before the Lord found you, even if you had all the money in the bank, all the possessions, you had all the nicest stuff, you had all the technology, you had all the comfort, your life BC before Christ was aimless, purposeless, and hopeless. Can I I hear amen? Amen. All the money in the bank didn't satisfy your heart. All the strivings of even religious work didn't bring you peace. If you get really honest, you just were standing around in a parking lot, figuratively spinning your wheels because you had absolutely no traction on eternity or hope or meaning or peace or anything that mattered. But there's a master who doesn't stay in his vineyard and kick his boots up and say, wow, let me just enjoy all of my goodness to myself. No, we have a master that goes out and seeks those who are hopeless and those who are helpless and those who have no purpose. And you know what? Our master even goes to the places where people are trying to work themselves to death in order to get to heaven, to open their eyes and show them that unless you are born again, you will never inherit the kingdom of heaven. And many of us in this room could say, hey, that was me. I was in the the ditch of my depravity. I was wicked and evil and loving sin and living in it. And the master came and found me. 
And some of us could say, man, I was so clean on the outside. I went to church every Sunday. I knew the Bible. I prayed. But you know what? My heart had never been changed by the grace of God. And Jesus came and found me in my religion and gave me hope. Praise God. And what's amazing here is, because we'll see how he's going to apply it here in just a minute. Some of us have been saved a long time. (laughs) Some of us were radically changed when we were nine years old. Man, I love childhood testimonies. Justin said it before. If God saved you as a child, like rejoice in that. You know why? Because he spared you from a lot of that craziness that other people run into in their teenage years, in their college years, in their regret that, that haunts people in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s for what they did in their teenage years. And you know what? God in his grace saved you from all that. Some of you, you've been saved most of your life. Some of you got saved in the middle of your life. But you know what? I'm thankful the grace of God even is there for the 11th hour. And all through this, what do we see? We see the heart of the master. He doesn't have to do it, but he does it. He's not bound to do it, but he does it. Now we could expand from here. I just want to make one more comment. It's interesting that the master is the one that puts forth the terms. And I would just tell you right now, we don't get saved based off our spin on Jesus. We bow our knee to what he says. He tells us to repent and believe the gospel. He doesn't compromise his demands. And the reason he doesn't compromise his demands is that in order to know him, we have to turn from sin. We cannot come to the altar of salvation holding on to our sin and telling Jesus we want to be married to him. It doesn't happen that way. We don't come to Christ saying, I believe in what you did for me, but I'm going to trust everything that I can do to kind of help me along. No, sir. The heart that comes to know Christ is the one that says, sin is killing me. And I, I want to turn from it. And Lord Jesus, I have no hope in my religious attendance. I have no hope in my good works. I have no hope in the best that I can do. No one is righteous before you. You alone are righteous. You took my place and I wholly trust in you. That's how you really come into his vineyard. So we see the master's heart. Sadly though, secondly, we see, I would say, this is some, not all, but some of the servant's hearts. And the sentiment of their heart is that they feel entitled for more. So this master has come out and found them. And this master has invited them into his vineyard. And this master um, has promised them that he will reward them. And so notice it says in verse 8, when evening came. One commentator said it this way. When evening comes, we aren't in the hiring business anymore. We're in the paying business or or the rewarding business. And it says that when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last. Now, there's a reason for that. You would think, naturally, the people that had worked hard all day would be the ones that would be asked to come to the front of the line. The reason why the last ones who have just been on the job for one stinking hour are brought first is to expose the hearts of those that have been there all day. Now, keep in mind, there's 11 born-again disciples following Jesus, one devil who wouldn't repent, but this is the context. The context is believers. The context is those that follow Jesus. That's the context. And the master's been going through all day long, bringing people in. And now it's time to, to, to reward, to fulfill his promise, to keep his word. And so he brings the last up first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Man, they got paid for the whole day. (laughs) What? If you break that down and, you know, you make $20 an hour and you work eight hours, it's $160 gross. Man, these dudes got it all. They came expecting twelfth of a denarius and they got the whole thing again what do you see heart of the master but when those hired first came 
They thought they would receive more. <laughs> but guess what? Each of them only, or each of them received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled. Notice they did not grumble at the agreement that was already in place. They are, in a sense, making accusations against the master. Now, I think the last time I asked, I phoned a friend in service and, and y'all, were, y'all were helping me. This is called an automatopoeia, right? The, 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 so one of y'all helped me last time. I was trying to think of that word. An automatopoeia is a word where the word itself, what, describes the sound, right? Is that right, English people? I know we got teachers. I always get scared when I, I get, somebody just did that, so I'm good to go. All right. So, so the, the idea is, here's your denarius. Thank you for your work. You know, it's just grumbling. And it's in perfect tense, as I mentioned earlier. So this is a continual action. It's not just some saying like, dude, I thought I was, what'd you get? Yeah, that's what we agreed to, but who is this guy, man? Like, that dude got, a den- he worked an hour. Man, he just didn't work an hour. You see those people over there? They, they only worked three hours. They got dinner. What? Who is this guy? Yeah, man, you see those people over there? They just worked half, the- work half the day. We were out there six hours earlier. You can just picture. Rah, rah, rah. I don't know if they were trying not to be heard. It does seem that they were speaking directly to the master in verse 12 because this is what they said. These last worked only one hour. Now, notice this next statement. You have made them equal to us. What entitlement? Coming to the table to get paid, instantly they forget that earlier in the day, they were out there with nobody to hire them, and now they got a leg up on everybody because they've been working all day. You see that? You've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. I mean, to their credit, they put in 12 hours. But I mean, you know, I I wrote this down. I was like, but they only work one day. Did they, we don't know where they worked the day before. I mean, all of this like, ah, ah, we've done it all. We've been at it 12 hours. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? What's going on here is the exposure of the heart that is not thankful for what has been freely given. Yeah, they earned the denarius, but check this out. The opportunity to earn the denarius was not something that they earned. The reward that they are receiving or the wage that they are receiving for their work was not merited or prompted or provoked from any goodness in themselves. It was freely given because the master of a vineyard went out all day long to give people the opportunity to work and to provide for their family. How quickly we forget. We oftentimes look at our life And we expect God to do so much. And we expect that like God is indebted to us. And we forget that the only reason that we stand in this grace and faith that we stand in is because he sought us out first. And I can get like this. Lauren will tell you that I have this like ingrained sense of justice. And it can extend to like tyrannical governments and it can extend to somebody cut me off in traffic. We gonna get justice. In India, there's no such thing as a line. There's a funnel. And the funnel can be entered at any point. Many of you have been in other countries where there's not a line, there's a funnel. And guess what? The American system comes. I remember a few times that I just looked at something culturally in other countries and I was just like, that's stupid. (laughs) And somebody said, brother, this isn't your country and this isn't your culture. Okay. Okay. But this idea that we have a leg up because we've been in the game longer or our perspective is is more dominant or our perspective is greater, right? Maybe that's one of the reasons why before the throne of God, every, every language and tribe and tongue is represented in equal diversity to show us that God loves all cultures and there is no supreme culture. 
And there's probably other things that people do in nations that you would say, nah. And you'd go over there and be like, man, that's a better way to do it. I mean, surely there's got to be a better way than having 45 cash registers and none of them be open, right? I mean, there's got to be... (laughs) But this entitlement... You owe me, and you cannot give to them because I did more than them. What I want to put before you third this morning is the grateful heart. And the grateful heart says this, I didn't even deserve a denarius. Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. The the, the word take there is literally like to pick up, to take away. So apparently these dudes like wouldn't even take the money. They were going to stand there and protest and not take their paycheck and not take their denarius as a sign. We don't agree. And the master's like, hey man, like it's yours. Like take it. But notice what he says, middle of verse 14, take what belongs to you and go, I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? How often we forget that the only reason this morning that we are not out doing wild and crazy things inwardly outwardly mentally physically emotionally is because of his generosity he hasn't just saved us from hell he is saving us from our sin the confronting conviction of the holy spirit is one of the greatest graces that god gives that god comes at us hard and says no we ain't gonna put up with that Some other times he can come at us hard. Sometimes he can come at us and woo us. The kindness of God bringing us to repentance. But the attitude here is, listen, it is the generosity of God that comes and looks at a lost, damned world and says, I'm not just not only going to think about you, I'm going to send my son as a demonstration. He's going to live a perfect life. He's going to take the wrath of God in your place for your sin. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise again. And his resurrection will be your resurrection. That's the gospel. And what I've found is, through my own personal battles and struggle, is that gratefulness and thankfulness for the grace of God squashes pride, entitlement, and a sense that I am greater than other people. Do you begrudge my generosity? Who are you, O man, to tell me, God, how I will bestow my mercy and grace? Who are you, create, created being, to tell the creator how much or how little grace he will give? Is, is your eye bad? Do you give me the stink eye because I delight in showing mercy? That's what's going on here. I can give them how much money I want. The master is saying, look at your heart. If I choose to make them equal with you, if I choose to reward them just like I rewarded you, if I choose to pay them more than than I paid you, he's not doing that. But even if he chose to do, who are you to begrudge my generosity? At least 33 of the Psalms include thanksgiving. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, Psalm 9-1. I will recount all your wondrous deeds. Psalm 26, I will wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. Psalm 50, the one who offers thanksgiving at his sacrifice glorifies me, says the Lord. Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And then in the New Testament, now listen how Paul 
the angle that Paul takes here. And I think this is important for us to understand. The context of this passage is some laborers in the vineyard being angry and jealous at, other, at the master because he shows mercy and grace towards other people in the vineyard. Listen to Paul. But thanks be to God that once you who were slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart. In Romans 1, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. 1 Corinthians 1, 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that is given you in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Philippians 1, 3, I thank my God in all remembrance of you. Colossians 1, 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Colossians 1, 12, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, we give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, we ought to give thanks to God for you because your faith is growing abundantly. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, beloved by the Lord. Philemon 4, I thank my God always when I remember you. And this is why. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 15. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase, what? Thanksgiving to the glory of God. The attitude here that Jesus is promoting is saying, man, the master's out and he's bringing people in all day at the vineyard and guess what? If somebody comes in at 559, 59 seconds, guess what? We should abound in thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul's been working in the vineyard a long time and he's been putting up with a whole lot of junk from Corinth and he says, I thank my God for you. So what are some notes <coughs> from this passage? First, God sought me out when I had no hope. I was standing idle. I'm in grace. You're in grace if you're in grace this morning because he came and found you. Secondly, since God saved me, I want more to be saved. <laughs> As they approach the vineyard, I'm not saying, hmm, I wonder if my reward's gonna be greater than theirs because look at me, been slaving all day. It's Lord, you're so generous to extend salvation to all peoples. And if I end up in glory, I will not end up there on my works or my merit or my righteousness, and nobody else will too. And so, Lord, you've given me yourself. Thank you. Please bring more. Third, all God's people are equal. We are forever thankful for his love, mercy, and grace towards us in Christ. There will be no comparison at the judgment of what he gives us. Because we're told that the elders and the people before the throne take their crowns off and they lay them at the feet of the throne, which tells us that however we are rewarded in heaven, guess what? <laughs> we will recognize immediately and for all eternity that the only reason we were able to work in the vineyard is because he came and found us and he sustained us throughout the day. Yeah, I wonder the, the, the amount of water breaks that went in this day too. Dr. Loach, good old salt tablets, you know? Aren't you thankful that he just doesn't say, hey, go work? But all throughout the day, he comes and nourishes you and takes care of you and helps you and sustains you so that at the end, we can either look and walk around and, and brag and say, what a great job we did in the vineyard. No, we will say, Lord, the only reason I made it is because you came and found me and the only reason I made it is because you sustained me. See, when you have that gospel consciousness like that, you're not looking around comparing yourself to other people, wondering who's better or greater in the kingdom of heaven. And that's why Jesus says at the end, the last will be first and the first will be last. And you know what he means by this? He means that we all finish together. So, so the ones that think they're out in front, guess what? <laughs> they're they're pulled even. And the ones who feel like they are just trailing behind, guess what? At the end, they make it. I'm not John Wesley. <clears throat> You're not Charles Spurgeon. None of us are Amy Carmichael. 
None of us are C.T. Studd or Billy Graham. But all of us are recipients of the free grace of God. And so this morning, if you're struggling, man, and you feel like everybody's lapping you spiritually, can I just encourage you to take heart and fight sin and keep going and confide in a few believers around you to help pick you up and run with you? And Because guess what? The last will be first. And can I just encourage you, man, if it's good right now and you just read through Hebrews for the 85th time and can help us all understand it a little better. And if you're fighting sin left and right and you've got some victories, just remember that the only reason that you're in the Christian life is because of him. And the first will be last. They'll come in just the same way. By God's grace. Does that make sense? So, so going into Thanksgiving, a grateful heart. And I think it speaks to us, Peter. <laughs> Lord, we left everything to follow you. We're better than this guy. Hey, Peter, you're really not. So this week, let's be thankful. And it all starts with what we will celebrate in just a few moments. So we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. And what that is a visual picture of is the fact that we were hopeless and helpless. We were deserving of death and wrath. We were deserving of judgment. God was right, is right to judge the world because of our crimes against him, because of our sin and because of our rebellion. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth his own son. God's response to us was not judgment. God's response was to give his son. And the Bible teaches that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came down on a rescue mission. And he lived a life that we couldn't live. And he died a death that we should have died. And he was inserted. He not only died for us, he died instead of us. And all of our sin went on him so that if you would believe in him, all of his righteousness could go to you. He experienced the hate of God so that you could experience the love of God. He was separated from God that you might be reconciled to God. He was condemned that you might be forgiven. This is the gospel. And can I tell you this morning, what gets you out of sin into righteousness, what gets you out of darkness into light, what gets you out of death into life is not trying to be a little better. That'll condemn you all the more. But what we celebrate this morning is that his body was broken and that his blood was shed. And you see, he did that to demonstrate the love of God for us. How can a holy God let unrighteous sinners off the hook? He can't. And so the righteous one came and he died in our place for our sin. He took our punishment. And so Jesus said, as his people, we should celebrate that often that together we should remember what he's done for us. Because the more we remember what he has done for us, we are saved from entitlement and pride and self-righteousness and thinking that we are better than other people because he came and found us. That's the gospel. And so it's good for us here at Cross Point. We celebrate the Lord's Supper once a month. This is November, it's an odd month. We were supposed to do it last week. We're gonna do it this week, obviously. But what a great way to go into Thanksgiving, right? All of these things are because of Christ. So Daniel, you guys can come on up as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper. Just a few notes. I know we've got different families and guests with us this morning. Thanks so much for being here. The way we take the Lord's Supper here at Cross Point is that you don't have to be a member of our church, but the Lord's Supper is only for born-again believers, people that know Jesus. And we would much rather anyone in this room not take the Lord's Supper than just pose and act like you're a Christian when you know you're not. And can I just encourage you? The Lord's Supper is an invitation. If you don't know Jesus, you can know him today. You can be a part of his family. You can believe in what he's done for you. You can have your sins forgiven today. If you don't know Christ, 
There's many people in this room that love to talk to you. You can come talk to me. You can come talk to people that may have, you may have come with today. You can talk to me after the service, but I don't want you to miss out on the fact that you can know Jesus today. I'm going to pray in just a moment, and we're going to stand. We'll have three different places to get the Lord's Supper. Wimpeglers, if you guys would come on. Cupid's, um, if, uh, if you guys would come on. The Carly's, if you guys would come on. And so we're going to stand in just a moment, and we take it to, uh, together. We come to the front because we got to rub elbows with each other, right? And we got to dodge each other and move out. And it, and it reminds us that the Lord's Supper, he just didn't die for me. He died for us. Amen? He died for us. So let's look back and remember what he's done for us. Let's look in and examine ourselves to make sure that we're not coming to take the Lord's Supper today pompous and arrogant and self-righteous. And praise God, he's faithful to forgive us of those things if we need to do that heart repair this morning. But as you come, you're going to be around people. And this isn't like, you know, we can't say anything. We have to, like, sometimes it's good as we take the Lord's Supper to smile at fellow believers and to say hello to fellow believers because this, this is a community. And we look up and we worship as we take the Lord's Supper because we realize, Lord, the only reason we're here is because of your grace. But the Bible also tells us that as we take the Lord's Supper, we're looking forward because Jesus is gonna come back. The end of the day is gonna be done. And you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna take us home. We're gonna be with him forever. So what an opportunity for us to be thankful this morning unto the Lord. Let's pray and then we'll stand. <clears throat> we'll be singing going on and we'll take the Lord's Supper. You come and get the elements. Hold on to them. Go back to your seat. Remain standing. We'll all take it together in a few minutes. We'll worship the Lord together. Father, thank you that there is no one righteous, no, not one, but any who will believe in you and in what Christ has done can become righteous and forgiven and adopted and justified and sanctified. Lord, we don't deserve that. God, save me, my flesh, when it defaults to entitlement and pride. God, save us from when we think we're better than other people because we've been in the game longer. Lord, help us never to begrudge your generosity. And this morning, as we take the Lord's Supper, God, we are so thankful beyond anything, beyond what you've provided for us and material blessings, what you've given us in our families. God, above all that, we just confess the greatest thing we must be thankful for is that Jesus Christ died and rose again on our behalf. And God, I pray for anyone in this room that's not a reality this morning, that they would come to know Christ. But as we celebrate this, your death for us, let it fill us with joy and thanksgiving. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. You guys come forward. Go back to your seats. Sing along. We'll take the Lord's Supper all together in just a few moments. Lead us, Daniel.